panelists. I think those uh, presentations fit together pretty well, and there's a lot of very useful information. And this information will, with your permission, will be up on the website that we're setting up for this project, along with a lot of other resources. So now, um, questions or comments, and particularly if you have particular questions for Chris uh, in relation to LinkedIn. Um, yes. Hi. Thanks to all the presenters. My name is Ina, um, and I have a question for Chris. What would you say about um, the paid LinkedIn versus the free LinkedIn? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a tough one. Um, what was the question? What's what can I say about paid LinkedIn versus free LinkedIn? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. In terms of the benefits and access to yeah. employers and who checked your profile. Although yeah. Like I'm using the free one so far. Mm -hmm. I used the paid one for some time, but many years ago. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed is that I'm able to see who checked uh, my profile from which company and even their area. Yeah. Without yeah. uh, making the payment, <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, I I just want to get a sense of the added advantage, if you would. Thank you. So, it's a it's a premium feature for a reason, right? In that there is added advantages to paying for LinkedIn. Does that warrant the cost of it? It depends on where you are, right? Um, when I was in the in the point of searching for a job. I did end up paying for LinkedIn Premium. Uh, looking back on it, I, I don't fully know if I garnered as much benefit from it as I thought I would. Um, personally, I just have the free version of LinkedIn and I, I'm fine with that. That being said, LinkedIn Premium allows you to do a lot of different things, including like in-message to, to people that um, you're not necessarily connected with. Um, it gives you the, the richer uh, analytics to show who's been trying to reach out to you or who's been looking at your profile. So it's a, it's a hard question. I would say there is benefit to paying for, for LinkedIn, but it's not kind of absolute. You don't absolutely have to pay for it to, to garner benefit from using LinkedIn, but it does give you some benefit. Yeah, that makes, I, I know that's, that's me kind of sitting on the fence there of saying sort of, but not really, but yes. But no. But no. <laughs> I think, isn't it fair to say though that before paying for LinkedIn Premium, it's better to really fully optimize yes. the free yes. version? For sure. And for I, sure. And I think that some of the tips that you know, I'd rather see people invest the time mm -hmm. in, you know, making their LinkedIn profile, the free version, as robust and as exciting exactly. and as appropriate as possible. And if that's not doing the job then, then maybe you can yeah. to LinkedIn Premium. That's a good point. If you expect that paying for it is automatically going to like explode the number of people you're connected to and like garner all of these benefits, no. That's not that's not it. If you're not doing the basic work on the front end with the basic version of LinkedIn, you're probably not gonna garner the benefit when you do end up paying for it. So And in my experience it's it's being HR people, so it's mostly on the hiring end that yeah. will pay for it versus, um, or recruiters uh, who will pay for it. It's, I don't find it as useful as a job seeker to, to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Unless you're really interested in who's looking at your profile, but, but if they're looking at your profile, it doesn't necessarily, it's likely out of curiosity, it's not a job. And you can just ask to connect with them at the end of the day, right? If they are looking at your profile, you can connect and say, send them a message and say, I saw that you were looking at my profile. I'd like to connect with you. I mean, yeah. It's usually my mom. <laughs> <laughs> looking at my mom looking at my profile. But uh, when, when you know it's HR people, you'd want to do uh, more. I'm, I'm asking from my background because I, uh, I think I've made good use of it. Yeah in the arena I was working mm -hmm. in internationally. But the issue is breaking through the job market in Canada, that's a whole different story. Yeah. So I've used it for many years to do the best of uh, my abilities. I have a well set profile. But I have questions of how to make best use of it. Uh, 
I was just going to say that might be the kind of thing that we should discuss on the website and get other people's experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, some of these um, questions and discussions have to continue. We're not going to solve it all tonight. I think it's a good question. Yeah. Have because you used it, it is specific to the barriers here. Have you used it in some of the ways that Chris was suggesting? You know, posting updates, using the pulse feature, that kind of thing here? There's a couple of tips that I will take. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. And I'm sure that Hi, thank you for your presentation. So my question is like when uh, uh, I already have a LinkedIn profile, but I'm not very active in, I do network with LinkedIn with people, but I'm not that active in searching jobs and like following people. Mm -hmm. uh, one question is like, uh, when, I, when we list the job experience, the work experience, uh, do we need to list separately the voluntary as well as the um, real work experience, or we can just list it together? Mine are interspersed. Mm -hmm. uh, I just identify that I, I was a volunteer in the role. Okay. So where it says uh, what the job actually was, mm -hmm. um, I put in brackets, volunteer, volunteer. Okay, because like I have got really a good uh, volunteering experience because while I was studying like I have been always volunteering in research and kind of groups mm -hmm. so um, I'm thinking I'm just wondering whether um, yeah I, I mean I'm of the mindset that volunteer there's for me there's no difference between paid work experience and volunteer work experience except for the fact that I got paid yeah. At the end of the day, I'm still using my skills in the same way, and I'm still garnering skills, yeah. especially if it's a very kind of specific mm -hmm. sort of volunteer role. Um, so I, I personally, I list my volunteer experience when, when it's applicable. I list it in my work experience as well, and I'll do the same thing. I'll list it as just volunteer yeah. because, yeah, I don't, I don't see the difference. Even on my resume, I don't have like a volunteer work section. I'll put it into my work experience because that's my experience working, right? Whether or not I get paid for it is kind of irrelevant at the end of the day. Yeah. Like it's my experience working. The only oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. no, I was the only thing I was going to suggest is put it in both places. Mm. Put it in your work experience and then under volunteer. You mean in like on LinkedIn specifically? On LinkedIn yeah. specifically, yeah. 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 On LinkedIn where there is the volunteer because you don't know where people are going to start with their search. So mm -hmm. better to have it in both places. There's no harm in repeating mm -hmm. any of it because yeah. an HR person might, you know, depending on the role, might go directly click to your volunteer experience. Mm -hmm. and yeah, not because like I have worked quite a lot of volunteering experience because while studying the PhD, I was doing a lot of volunteering. Of yeah. So I don't want to miss those things because it's like more than a year. I have yeah. so. Especially if they're formal roles, that you were a volunteer, you may not even have to specify volunteer. Um, yeah, I was involved in a board like uh, as a research advisor, so it's a small charity, but still like uh, those places. I used to write concept notes and things, so yeah, so I don't want And those to are things people get paid for, like it, as well. Yeah, yeah, because I was a student, so yeah. <laughs> it's like hired for volunteering, but then the their mm -hmm. skills, because like, when it comes to like, if I put in volunteering, I have a feeling that other people won't notice that. It, 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 for yeah. whatever reason, it, it devalues it a lot of the time. Yeah. It's a challenge. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Chris. Uh, like most of us uh, immigrate from other countries to here, and there you have a specific profile, which is like showing uh, increasing trend in your career prospects and like when you come here there is a transition phase so in which like you are into different kind of precarious job and survival job yeah and then after a couple of years or so you start uh, gaining your ground so how to address that gap in your linkedin profile mm -hmm. basically because when you update there is clearly right. visible gap and how to address that that transition time, that's a, that's a hard one. I don't know, my, my time was, I was a truck driver for four years. Uh, I don't put it on my resume, on my LinkedIn profile at all, but that makes me four years younger, so that's not something <laughs> that just disappears. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I don't know, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure if, uh, 
I think it's not something that you need to identify on LinkedIn. Yeah. It's something that might need to be explained in a interview yeah. circumstance. Yeah. But I think there's no reason to draw attention to it because it's, e it's difficult to explain on LinkedIn. I hear that. And I, I think yeah. I understand your concern as well, that having that long gap reduces the chance of you actually getting the interview, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of this chicken and egg scenario where you need the work experience to get the job, but to get the job, they're asking you to have the work experience mm -hmm. um, and that you have a significant gap, which might make employers nervous. So how to address that is, that's, that's tough. I was just that's thinking, <laughs> just put, not in prison for this <laughs> period of time. <laughs> but I, I think, excuse me, sorry, I was just gonna say, I think part of this has already been addressed in, in the sense, I think most of the people here um, have significant and important um, training or volunteer, volunteer experiences experience. during that period. Yeah. So it doesn't have to look like a time gap, or at least not to the mm -hmm. degree that might be problematic. It's a question, of, as our colleagues were explaining, it's a question of um, focusing on, on the skills that you exhibited or mm -hmm. the skills that you acquired. That's true. Um, yeah, thanks, So, I mean, I agree with that, and, and that's really important. At the same time, though, going back to what Boyd was saying at the beginning, and also, I mean, I think everybody's talked about it, be authentic and give a flavor of yourself. I have seen some LinkedIn profiles where people are, I mean, I'll give you an example. I saw a LinkedIn profile of somebody who know, I know was fired from her previous job, and I saw her LinkedIn profile, and it said something on it like, um, you know, period of professional and personal change, exploring new uh, avenues. You know, like she, she put a spin on it, which was about like, I'm going through some change in my life, and I'm, and you know what I mean? So it is an opportunity maybe to like, uh, you could say, you know, whatever. Put a little bit of your brand in there as well. Acknowledge that, you know, you've been doing these different pieces, and you are looking for that next step. Mm -hmm. Exploring new yeah, opportunities in a new country. So, yeah. you know, there's different ways of, but you're right, you don't want to just a big blank, but you, you have to put something mm -hmm. in and uh, next question to Boyd mm -hmm. is, apart from LinkedIn, LinkedIn uh, which is like highly professional platform, uh, you suggested to create a profile in Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, Facebook public profile if you want to, uh, not your ordinary personal profile. Uh, but Twitter is, to me, the easiest to set up and use in a professional capacity. It requires attention, though, on a you know, on a daily basis uh, to to actually begin to connect with people, to begin to post things you know that interest you, that give your you know they give a sense of who you are. Uh, it requires more regular updating, I think. You know? Which is more suggested, Facebook or Twitter? I would say Twitter. Thank you. I have another question. So, uh, actually, in my LinkedIn, there are some professional members. So they um, they advertise jobs. So um, I'm following them. Like they, I'm reading their articles, and then if I'm applying jobs, like, and is it is it okay to contact them through LinkedIn message, or like I have to be emailing them? So contacting the HR people, you mean, or Not the, the people? HR, like it's like uh, professors. Some professors, they just or senior scientists, they just. Uh, Advertised job like uh, hiring postdoctoral fellow or. Research. But you're connected with this person, the professors on LinkedIn itself. Uh, yes, and also I have been for interviews before, so that's how I know them, and I'm I'm already linked in with them. So if I'm applying for the job, mm -hmm. so is it okay to contact them through LinkedIn, or I have to uh, write a professional email like? Uh, so can I put on my employer hat? Yeah. And I've been working in the sector for 35 years, and then the last 20, I participated in hundreds of uh, recruitment processes. And people do contact me. They'll say, because if we're, if we're connected, and they'll say, hey, I saw that posting at your organization. And I'll respond, I'll go, you know what, I have nothing to do with that. This is how you apply. And then often, internally, I will send a message to the person who is in charge of that posting and say, hey, 
keep your eye out for that name. Because somebody's because just the fact that somebody's contacted me that way shows some it's a little bit outside the box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if nothing else, the person who's reviewing resumes is gonna have your name. That doesn't mean your name's gonna be selected, but it might. They're gonna see your name. And if you know, all things being equal, they heard, they had a little note for me saying keep your eye out for that name. They might pull it for it. It doesn't mean you're going to get the job. It doesn't mean anything like that, but it's a little connection. It's a little something. So I would say it's worth it. I've never, ever been bothered by being contacted that way by people. And, I, you know, I have hundreds and hundreds of LinkedIn uh, contacts, right? So I, you know, as an employer, I've never been bothered. So I, I, I think... Uh, because that's why we're on LinkedIn. We all know that yeah. that's what LinkedIn is about. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. yeah. I think one of the, like to Excel's point, one of the best um, pieces of advice a former professor gave me when it came to applying for jobs um, was bringing small cards with me and just writing a thank you note and then leaving it with the receptionist for the person who interviewed me. Because any way that you can set yourself apart from the other applicants is is good and you know there might be people who will be turned off by anything you do there might be people who be, are turned off by the way you say hello you can't control people at the end of the but day they're not right? going to hire you anyway exactly <laughs> so <laughs> that's my philosophy so you just have to put your best foot forward and yeah and see what happens i have a tidbit an idea so my um okay well um, um i'll tell you after what i'm thinking <laughs> when you are branding yourself Meaning is that you are labeling yourself, but when we apply for a specific job, we need to fit ourselves according to their requirement. How we can make a balance? I imagine many of you are research, or your researchers are academics and uh, have an area of expertise. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And uh, so. Uh, if I were branding you, I would I would keep it general enough that you I imagine you all want to work in that area that you've chosen to spend your like dedicated your life to studying, um, and uh, you sort of want to keep your foot in it to some degree. Uh, this actually relates to one of the ideas I had. There's a there's a Canadian website called The Conversation, and what that is is uh, is some really I, my, my area of expertise is, is not networking or social media, it's, it's, uh, it's media, I, I do media relations hmm. for the most part, um, and, I, and I build leaders. Uh, the, what the conversation does is it's, it's attracted some really high profile editors from the New York Times, from, um, uh, from another media outlet in London, and, and what they do is they're merging academia with, uh, with media. Uh, and and uh, what these editors are doing is they've gone out to academics to write articles that, that regular people would read, so making uh, research or expertise more accessible. And, uh, and, they, and these editors will work with you to write an article about a timely topic. And their, their um, articles are fantastic, and lots of other media outlets pick them up from there. And that might be a way to keep your fingers in your field um, pitching an article to them, and, and the editor will help you write it. But if you could get your like your piece published, uh, it it's, it continues to establish your brand, the leader in your area of expertise. Let me give you an example, though, of, uh, from a professional perspective. I just I'll read my Twitter profile. Uh, it says, "Senior digital strategist and college social media teacher, interested in the impact of social." on discourse and activism, read my blog please. So I've said who I am, what I do, but I've also said what engages me is activism and social media um, in that. And then when you look at the things I tweet about, they're, they're always professional, but with a slight edge to them. So for example, I tweeted just two hours ago, quote, if I can't dance to it, it's not my revolution, Emma Goldman, you know, because it creates that, you know, she was an anarchist and, uh, and a revolutionary, and it creates that sense that I'm slightly iconoclastic. This is conscious. I mean, I don't, 
tweet, and I've tweeted 10,000 times, I don't tweet things that aren't a reflection of who I am, but always in a professional, well, except for the one where I, the CBC is reporting that conservative, unelected senators are going to try and kill pot legislation today. That seems quite democratic. I retweeted that. And exactly what Harper said was so good about the Senate, right? A little bit of nasty politics in there, but still professional. Uh, generally speaking. So I'm not saying when I'm, you're creating your personal brand that you're going nuts. It's creating a sense of who you are other than the jobs you've done, that's all. And, and that's not going to be a conflict when you go into, uh, you know, when you do your resume or you go in for an interview. It's going to enhance things because it gives a sense of who you are as a person. And I can assure you that if you listen to the lessons that we've taught here, or communicated here, that when an, in, uh, when an interviewer is sitting there and they have many researchers, I mean, it's hard to get a job as an academic in Canada, I think, you know, for people who are trained here, uh, they're going to have to decide between two people with similar skills, and you want to be the person they say, gee, I." I like to work with that person. And how are they going to know that? They're going to know that because of the way you present yourself, not because of anything that's on the list of things. Uh, it's how you talk about yourself, the things that engage you. And they'll say, you know, I, I tweet about hockey. You know, I'm a Maple Leafs fan. I've, I mean, I've had to look for a job for 30 years, so I can, you know, I've never had that, but I've used it to pitch. You know, when I, I, I was responsible for pitching a lot of new business for the agency, so I'm constantly meeting people who I didn't know. You always look for the thing that will connect you with the person. You know, is it hockey? Is it politics? Is it smoking weed? You know, you don't know what it is, <laughs> but you find that single thing, and that's how you that's how you do business development when you're in an agency. So by you creating that sense of who you are, you increase the chance that there'll be that kind of connection and link with you that distinguishes you, you from everybody else. That uh, and I assure you, you know, in the positions that I've been in, I've uh, constantly being approached by people for jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, can I give one more example? Is it time? No, you, that's it. And then we're going to move to the next part of the meeting. Okay. I give the one example is, is that I had, there's a, I got a woman hired out of the Humber program I teach. And uh, she was a woman that had purple hair and a nose ring and tattoos. And, uh, you know, we're, we're the, a leading agency in Canada, public relations and public affairs agency. And if you looked at her, you'd think, why would I want to hire her because she looked like, uh, you know, somebody that hangs out down here in Kensington. And, uh, but she was fascinated by data, you know, by, uh, she worked at a, at a Sysimals, which is a, a social search thing, and she was fascinated by data. And I thought, here's a person that she's got incredible energy, she's got this attitude that says, I'm going to define myself by my nose ring and my tattoos and my purple hair but I love numbers. I thought, boy, I want to work with that person. So I got her hired. I wasn't working there anymore, but I thought everybody else would. And it was, you know, there was, she did, out of the hundreds of students I teach, she just, it was that combination that made the difference. And you don't know what it is. Um, so don't shy away from your personality. It can make the difference to an employer. It did in my case, and it occurred. And we're going to wrap up there just because of time. Thanks again. For coming.